And I want to welcome uh, and thank our panelists for being here. Thank everyone in the audience and our uh, online audience through the, through the webcast. Um, this is the second annual home stretch at the Supreme Court event that the Constitutional Accountability Center has sponsored. Um, we think it's kind of the perfect time, right after uh, the last oral argument of the term, to start assessing first what the court has already done so far, which has issued a fair amount of opinions, um, some in pretty significant cases, and second, heard oral argument in every case, including the the real blockbusters of the term, the marriage equality case, the health care case, a few others that we'll be talking about today. And so uh, we think this is kind of the perfect time to have a panel to assess where the court is going, to start um, developing themes of what this, how we should think in more, uh, more broadly about what happened this year. Um, and we're, we're delighted to have you all uh, participate in that conversation. Um, uh, you can mark your calendars because we plan on making this an annual event. So next year, the Thursday after the, you know, so the last Wednesday in April is usually when they have the last oral argument at the court. Mark in your calendars the uh, thurs last Thursday in April for our home stretch event because we, we plan to make it a, an annual thing. Um, so with that, I'm just going to turn it over to our panel and particularly our distinguished moderator, uh, Amy Howe. Amy um, was uh, first a founding partner at one of the truly great boutique Supreme Court law firms in town, Goldstein and Howe. She is now the editor of SCOTUS blog, um, which is transforming um, the way the Supreme Court is is watched and covered, and it's, I think, a truly important and truly great media um, voice in the whole and, and sort resource, uh, uh, source of resources in this Supreme Court coverage. And so we're delighted to have her moderate this year's panel. And with that, I'll turn it over to Amy. Thanks, Doug. It's great to be here. I want to thank Kelly Landis and the Center for putting together this terrific group of panelists. I'm going to introduce them briefly in a second. And it's been a slow week at the court, so they've had plenty of time <laughs> to get ready for today. Um, I'm going to do an alphabetical order. On my far left is Yakov Roth of Jones Day. He clerked for Judge Boudin and Justice Scalia on the court. And at Jones Day, he's in the appellate group and has been heavily involved in King versus Burwell. So we'll be looking for him to uh, chime in there a lot. And in last term's uh, First Amendment case, the Susan B. Anthony List versus Driehaus out of Ohio. Um, next, we have Paul Smith from Jenner and Block, who is the, he's the chair of the Supreme Court group there and has argued at the court 16 times on all kinds of issues from the First Amendment and violent, violent video games to voting rights and uh, in 2003 in Lawrence versus Texas. And then in the middle, we've got Elizabeth Wydra, the chief counsel at the Constitutional Accountability Center, who was a lawyer in private practice doing all kinds of interesting issues and appeals and is now at the center and is actively involved in litigating and amicus briefs at the court. So we're gonna start things off uh, again, since there's a lot to talk about at the court this week, not with opening statements or anything like that, but with a quick question for each of our panelists about what at the court, whether it's the decision yesterday in williams Yuley, um, the bizarre lineup in Yates versus United States, the Chief Justice's radio silence um, in King versus Burwell, or anything else surprised each of you so far at the court this term? I definitely think the williams Yuli case from yesterday was a big surprise. Uh, finally, the court found uh, some campaign finance regulation that it could uphold under a First Amendment challenge. And you know, it was literally one of those cases, my colleague David Gans, um, who is a campaign finance expert, we're all, of course, glued to SCOTUS blog in the morning as the orders come out you know, to the live blog. And I hear you know, from the office down the hall, Wow, that's a surprise. So <laughs> literally, it was a very, it's an answer to your question. That was a big surprise, and that Roberts joined the more liberal justices in upholding the uh, restriction on personal uh, judi solicitation from judicial candidates in Florida, um, which also will impact the other 30, I think, states that have a similar regulation. Um, it was a surprising move from Roberts, um, especially when you think about 
his previous ruling in the Caperton case um, about uh, sort of money and judicial elections, which he was on the other side, and he and Kennedy switched places in this one. And so it's sort of you know a second surprise from Roberts. I think another earlier surprise was his vote in the Young case, which I think we'll probably talk about um, later, uh, upholding um, the ability for victims of um, uh, pregnancy discrimination to bring those claims in court under the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So it's sort of Roberts making some surprise moves, certainly in areas where he's been, you know, much more conservative in the areas of campaign finance, and also when you look at his rulings in Ledbetter and other uh, gender discrimination cases where he has been uh, not so protective of women's rights to sue um, for discrimination. That was a big surprise to me. I was surprised by uh, the court's decision to re-argue the Johnson case, which is about, it was supposed to be about whether possessing a shotgun is a violent felony under the Armed Career Criminal Act. And, you know, it's, there was a split, you know, ordinary case. They've had a bunch of cases on whether uh, particular crimes fit into that statute's residual clause, which uh, basically gives you a higher sentence if you have prior felonies that present a serious potential risk of physical injury and trying to figure out what that means, what that applies to. And then the court ordered re-argument on the question whether that entire clause is unconstitutionally vague, uh, which I think took everyone by surprise. And at the re-argument, there seemed to be a, a coalition of justices who were prepared to say, uh, yeah, this is too vague, we can't make sense of it, and we're just gonna get rid of it, including, it seemed, the Chief Justice, which is also a bit of, a, bit of a surprise, given some of his uh, his views, but I think it does reflect a, a growing skepticism uh, on the part of the court, and maybe in particular on the part of the Chief Justice, to some of the overcriminalization and sort of creative prosecutorial theories that that we've been seeing, and they're starting to to push back against that. I think that case reflects it. I guess I would say the thing that surprised me was that the court was sufficiently aggressive that it went ahead and granted the ACA case at a time there was no circuit conflict and the D.C. Circuit was about to hear it on bond. Mm -hmm. I know Yakov probably figures it was obvious that there was cert petition was going to be granted. <laughs> he was not surprised. It did, it did seem like a very aggressive move uh, 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 given the procedural posture of the case. All right, and we're going to talk a lot more about that, actually, in just a minute. We're going to start, though, um, with a sort of a bigger framing question. Um, as he said yesterday in his opinion for the court, and williams Yuley, the Chief Justice likes to think of the court and, and judges more broadly as being above politics. But we've had in the last couple of years and, and this term several of the administration's sort of signature initiatives, the Affordable Care Act, the Clean Air Act, um, back up at the court again. Um, and so. The, the question for, for the three of you is, it, are the, the fates, uh, the, the legacies of the Roberts Court and the Obama administration intertwined um, or, or not? Clearly, I think that given that the ACA is such a huge part of the Obama administration's sort of package of achievements, if it, if it ends up being uh, undercut in, in a very substantial way, that will affect the, the perception of whether the Obama administration accomplished something domestically. The environmental stuff is very important too. The court doesn't seem to be quite as, as pushing back as hard on that, at least so far. Maybe they will. Uh, they've, they've allowed some of the clean air stuff to go through in the, on the global warming front. The other thing I would say is I think it's true for a different reason, which is the Obama administration has, by this time at least, kind of embraced the cause of LGBT equality in a way that no other administration mm -hmm. has come close to doing. Uh, not defending DOMA, getting rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and now arguing very strongly for marriage equality. And so if, if the plaintiffs win the marriage case, I think he will be perceived as having basically been transformative in that area. If we lose the marriage case, that could be a very different uh, sort of end to the story, I think. I, I think they're definitely intertwined in the sense that, you know, you have Roberts being very um, uh, adamant in both I think the writing you referred to in his judicial opinion, but also in his public comments, you know, in his more public-facing remarks about the court, has been uh, very adamant about his idea that you know he doesn't want the partisan rancor to spill across the street um, into the Supreme Court building. You know, that sort of belongs to the more political branches and uh, the legislative and executive branches, and you know, trying to say you know we're not Republicans and Democrats up here; we're judges. And I think one of the sort of ways in which uh, the public has sort of thought that Chief Justice Roberts has lived up to that was 
with his vote to uphold the ACA against constitutional challenge. But I think there's a major asterisk to that, depending on what he does in the King case. So, you know, I think, um, you know, what he does in King will sort of depend, will sort of impact his legacy when it comes to whether or not he, the court really is above partisan politics and is not just, you know, pushing uh, a certain party's agenda. And so I think if um, he votes to strike down, um, I'm sorry, to interpret the provision at issue in the King v. Burwell case to um, go against the administration, then I think that will color his previous vote to uphold um, the case against constitutional challenge. What I would add is uh, I think the, the president's legacy in a sense depends quite a bit more on what some of the lower courts have been doing, uh, particularly the immigration uh, reform that uh, the executive immigration reform that, that uh, he issued is now at, uh, at risk of being totally derailed by the Fifth Circuit, by the district court in, in Texas and by the Fifth Circuit. It may never reach the court if the Fifth Circuit affirms a preliminary injunction and the time uh, elapses of the presidency, it could, it could be dead just based on lower court action. And frankly, with respect to the uh, Affordable Care Act and, and King, if the D.C. Circuit hadn't, if a panel of the D.C. Circuit ha hadn't ruled uh, the way it did, that the IRS regulation was invalid, I don't know that it would have made it up to the Supreme Court. Um, and, you know, there's uh, other uh, areas of, of regulation where the D.C. Circuit has been ag more aggressive <coughs> towards the, the, uh, the agenda of the administration. I think that's had a, a really significant impact on how things have shaken out, maybe more so than, uh, than some of the justices might have preferred. That's great. So let's circle back then to King. Paul, you were surprised because the Fourth Circuit had upheld the subsidies, the D.C. Circuit had invalidated them, but then the en banc D.C. Circuit granted rehearing. And so we all thought that we, we were going to have to wait for that to play out. But one Friday afternoon in November, um, at around 1245, the court grant, went ahead and granted cert. Elizabeth, were you surprised? You know, I, I was a little surprised, you know, like Paul, um, I, you know, given that the D.C. Circuit had vacated the panel ruling, um, in my opinion, correctly, um, and were going to reconsider it, and they were acting with considerable dispatch. So it wasn't as if, you know, they were sitting around waiting and the court was like, no, we can't wait that long. I mean, they were, you know, going, moving quickly. And since there wasn't a split in the circuit courts, I was a little surprised. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't take it necessarily as a bad sign. Um, you know, the court could have simply wanted to, um, you know, this is obviously very important to millions and millions of Americans whose lives literally depend on getting these subsidies to help them afford health insurance. So, you know, it's a very important issue. So I, I was surprised, but I didn't take it to be the ominous sign that some um, on my side might have uh, thought it was and that some on uh, Yakov's side might have, you know, rejoiced about. <laughs> Well, I, I was certainly pleased by the decision, but I actually was not at all surprised by it. I'd, uh, from pretty early on in the case, I'd been saying to my colleagues, uh, if we win before a panel, uh, that will be enough to get the Supreme Court to take it, even if the, the, the on-bank court decides to rehear the case. And I, I said that because, principally because I think the optics were just really bad um, based on the uh, Harry Reid's uh, use of the, the nuclear option to uh, push through uh, a bunch of additional judges to the DC Circuit and sort of change the balance was very controversial uh, at the time politically. And he sort of made a comment after that said, this case kind of played a role in that decision. And I think that really backfired. And I think it, it created a, a very bad optics that made it look like uh, there had been this sort of manipulation and, and I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, helped tip the balance in favor of the Supreme Court saying, uh, we're going to, we'll, we'll take over from this. We don't want to see that process play out. I also think we were helped by the fact that there was this Oklahoma District Court that came out the same way as the D.C. Circuit panel shortly before the court had to make, uh, make its decision at conference. So the notion that, oh, this is all going to get worked out really soon. The D.C. Circuit is going to take care of it. There won't be a split. Was, was undermined because then we had another court going the same way and we went up and said in our reply brief, you know, uh, in, in favor of the cert petition, this isn't going to go away. Uh, there's other cases. There's, Indiana has a case. There will inevitably be more cases if you don't uh, 
resolve it now. And it's just better for everybody if it gets resolved one way or the other sooner. And I think that had some force. Do you think that's what makes it different? I mean, part of what was going on at, at roughly the same time is we'd had Justice Ginsburg talking about same-sex marriage, saying, oh, you know, don't, don't count on us granting cert in October because there's no circuit split right now. Um, and it, but, well, I mean, they're really different hurt. issues, obviously. But. Yeah, nobody, you know, in that situation, a lot of courts had come out in favor of, of, uh, of the, the challengers to the, to the marriage bans. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so what was the big deal if it, you know, if that continued to play out you know they're getting what they are asking for. It's not yet nationwide, but there hadn't again there hadn't been a split. Um, on the other hand, with this we had <laughs> we had you know it was billions of dollars a month that were mm -hmm. that were being paid. Argue you know in our view illegally, and if that were after the fact to be uh, you know for the court to decide that was illegal, it creates all sorts of sort of issues that that I think nobody wanted to deal with. Uh, Paul, you, you have something say, to say. I, I agree with Yakov that there is a pretty good argument that the, the King case needed to get decided by the court at that point and needed to get decided sooner rather than later. Uh, the, the point you made, though, about the denials of cert in October in the, in the marriage cases, I was just flummoxed by that, because not because there was a split or anything, but because the, the denials of the cert meant all the stays went away, and so you were going to have thousands of marriages happening. Uh, and it's a very bizarre thing to have three different circuits, dozens of federal district courts ruling against uh, state laws, producing what are essentially irreparable consequences, uh, and not have the Supreme Court decide whether they're right or wrong. Uh, so it, it, yeah. the argument for cert seemed to be extraordinarily powerful, and it leaves you to think, well, they must have really known where the votes are even back in Perry, because that, otherwise the, the, the conduct of denying cert in those cases, and of course later denying a stay in Alabama and stuff, seems to be inexplicable to me. So. I didn't mean to suggest I was surprised. I wasn't surprised. Yeah. I was surprised that they didn't grant cert in that. I just think there was a difference in terms of the practical consequences, maybe how they saw the practical Pretty consequences, consequences particularly if they thought they knew how it was going to yeah. come out. You know, what's the rush, right? I mean, but getting to the sort of, you know, pol political and is the court above politics or not, I, I do think having those two fairly close in time, you know, might have in some quarters undermined the chief's uh, claim that the court um, is is above politics because some folks certainly you know especially after there were some uh, remarks by a colleague of Yakov's that you know that that he didn't think that the you know Supreme Court justices were going to care what you know a bunch of Obama appointees on the DC Circuit said you know I do think that the fact that they you know arguably reached out and took the case a little earlier could have been seen by some as you know engaging in that more political action while taking a step back from the marriage cases and letting that percolate through the states in sort of the more kind of usual system <coughs> until there's a, a clear split. All right, so we'll move on to the, to the oral argument. And as I mentioned, the Chief Justice was nearly silent, which surprised me. Um, so that left all of us to obsess about Justice Kennedy. Um, and he seemed to have concerns, <laughs> as we do on an almost daily basis. Um, do, he seemed to have concerns on, on both sides. So, so can, can any of you all sort of handicap where he might be going? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure we both took, um, you know, some some heart from comments from Justice Kennedy, which again is is very Justice Kennedy. Um, but uh, as you might recall, Justice Kennedy, um, in the case about whether or not uh, tax subsidies are available um, in every state across the country or just in states where they've established their own exchanges under the Affordable Care Act um, to provide a marketplace for health insurance. Um, so the argument is that. Uh, there was um, intentionally put in this statute this threat that um, states, you better set up your own exchange or um, you won't get tax subsidies to the constituents in your states who desperately need them in order to afford health insurance. Um, and uh, I should say that I represented a group of members of Congress who were uh, the primary drafters of the law. Um, as well as a group of state legislators who were charged with implementing the law in the states. And they, of course, say, uh, the members of Congress say that is certainly not how we wrote the law. Um, the members of the state legislators say that's not how we understood the law when we were determining whether or not to set up our own state exchanges or not. Um, and so Justice Kennedy's concern was that, you know, if the law actually worked the way that those who are challenging um, the IRS regulations said it does, then that is a severe threat to the states you know, set up this exchange or you lose this massive benefit 
to your constituents. And if that was really what Congress was intending, you know, would they have hidden it um, in, in an obscure provision of the Affordable Care Act? Uh, you know, my clients who wrote the law say no, <laughs> that's not how we did things. Um, but Kennedy was concerned that that caused this coercion problem, which um, he was concerned about in the first Affordable Care Act challenge. And so I took that, you know, one to be heartening because it showed that he understood the drastic consequences that would result if subsidies were not available in every state, the, the harm to the people who live in those states, he understood that. And two, it showed to me that he understood that it is rather absurd that you would have written the law in this way to have such a severe threat that uh, Congress didn't know they were making, the states didn't understand themselves to be threatened with. He certainly, uh, he certainly raised questions suggesting concerns about whether uh, interpreting the law the way we argued it should be interpreted based on its text uh, to create this incentive for states would be too coercive and therefore unconstitutional. <coughs> I don't know that he suggested that would be absurd. In fact, in, in the first, NFIB, in the first uh, Obamacare case in NFIB, the court said Congress had in fact done just that with the Medicaid expansion and struck it down. So whether, you know, <laughs> the fact that it may be coercive doesn't mean that's not what Congress did. Uh, it just means maybe it's unconstitutional. Uh, the question is, what does Justice Kennedy do with that concern in this case? Uh, I think the suggestion that was being made in the amicus brief that he was picking up this idea from was, well, you should read the statute a different way to avoid that constitutional concern. But you really only do that if the statute is ambiguous. And some of his other questions suggested maybe he didn't think it was, it was ambiguous. So in that situation, I'm not sure what you do other than say, well, stat this is what the statute says. I'm going to enforce it. And by the way, there may be a constitutional issue here that no state has, has challenged or raised, but they can go ahead and do that maybe in another case. And by the way, based on Justice Kennedy's dissent in the first Obamacare case, if he did think this was unconstitutionally coercive, arguably the remedy, the remedy he said that should be applied in the first case was that the whole act goes down, which is much more draconian than what we were arguing for in the case. So you know, this could really go either way. And I'm not sure it's uh, something that, that uh, supporters of the act necessarily want to be embracing. It seems to me, though, that given the array of, of lower court judges that have, read, have looked at this statutory interpretation issue ranging from those who say it un, un, ambiguously uh, limits the subsidies to the state exchanges to judge in the Fourth Circuit who said unambiguously goes the other way, it's pretty hard to imagine a majority of the justices saying it's sufficiently clear, even given this constitutional avoidance uh, argument and the Chevron defer, deference arguments and everything, that we're going to strike this thing and we're going to basically interpret it in a way that Justice Kennedy, at least, seems to fully accept, will destroy the health insurance markets in those states. I mean, it, it, it would be such an extraordinary thing for them to do, given the consequences, given the political setting, given the obvious ability of courts to read it both ways. I, I just seem to me that for him to, to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and read it in wooden fashion, ignore the context, ignore the question, the real question of what Congress intended, which you know is pretty obvious, it seems to me, uh, then and go ahead and read, read it that way and, you know, constitutional problem be damned, bring in a lawsuit about that and we'll strike the whole act down. I, that seems like a pretty remarkable scenario. To, but we'll have to wait and see. All right, so speaking of Chevron, that was one of the, the few comments that the Chief Justice did make at the oral argument, discussing Chevron and the idea that if the statute was ambiguous and this was this administration's interpretation of the provision, then a subsequent uh, administration could come in and change it. Uh, should we read much into that? I think it was a really interesting question. Considering uh, how few questions he asked? Yeah, it was one of the, the only... This was the one question he did? One of the only substantive questions he asked, and uh, it was interesting because there are really two very different readings of it. Uh, a lot of commentators after, after, the, after the argument uh, were discussing that question said, oh, this suggests that the Chief Justice is going to you know, have a compromise. You know, it's ambiguous. This administration could do what it wants, but you know the next administration can go the other way. So you know we're sort of not taking a side or something like that. That's not how I <laughs> interpreted the question, and maybe it's because I was on one side of the case. But uh, I understood the question to be saying, "Do you really think that Congress wanted this to flip back and forth between administrations? Your position, the government's position, is that this, these subsidies are so critical to operation of the scheme that it's absurd to think." that Congress could have conditioned them on anything because they're so important. Yet you want me to believe that 
they decided, well, we'll just let the IRS make a call one way or the other. We don't really care. They're just irreconcilable. So I think you, know, you can believe uh, that you know, Congress would never have done this, and so you know, whatever the text says, it can't be what Congress meant. OK. You can believe that Congress did mean it, or at least they said it, and it's not absurd. That's our position. But to say that Congress just left it up to the IRS and you know, was fine having it you know, jump back and forth depending on political whims, uh, I think is not a, 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 a credible position to take. Actually, inherent in the Chevron concept of deference to administrative interpretations is that it can change back and forth, and the law is pretty clear that you don't look any more skeptically at a second interpretation than the first one, even if it contradicts the prior one by the prior administration. So I don't know. It seems to me uh, the, 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 the commentator's uh, interpretation makes at least as much sense as that. I mean, that, you know, he was exploring options of how he might have to phrase the opinion to save the bill one more time, and, and uh, uh, that was at least passing through his mind. I'm not saying that means he's going to do it, but I, it would seem to me that's at least a very plausible interpretation of what he was thinking. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I think, look, I, I think that the statute is clear that the subsidy should be available to every state. It's, it's you know, um, I think we agree that, uh, you know, um, if you support the law, that the supporters of the law do think they are crucial to the operation of the law, and hence, if you take them away, that's why we have these disastrous consequences to the insurance market. Um, so while I do think the law is clear and that and, and uh, the administration should win even without resort to Chevron, it's very difficult to see if you get to whether a question of whether the law is ambiguous and whether the IRS is interpreting it in a way that is reasonable that you don't uphold the regulation. I think you know you get to the Fourth Circuit majority opinion. Um, and I think, you know, I, I saw that as the chief saying, you know, look, if, um, uh, if, if I generally don't like Obamacare, um, is this sort of the best way that I can see forward um, to, to uphold the law and um, not come across as, you know, simply, um, you know, voting against the law because I politically personally don't like it, then that's, you know, perhaps arguably more palatable than um, because it allows a subsequent administration to change it, but you know, I, I don't think, I, I I don't think you need to get to Chevron. But if you do, I think it's very hard to see how the administration does not win. Can I just add one point, which is um, the uh, we had argued throughout the case. You know, this isn't really a Chevron question because this isn't the type of thing Congress would have uh, delegated to an agency, and. The government came back time after time, citing this case from a couple of years ago, City of Arlington, where the court said, you know, Chevron applies to big questions and small questions. Chief Justice Roberts dissented in that opinion. And if you look at his dissent, he said, no, you, you have to look at whether it's reasonable to think that Congress would have wanted the agency to, to decide this question. Would they have really delegated it? And he said, in that case, no, they wouldn't have delegated it. And I, th that perhaps is informing uh, how I interpreted the question. Not saying the other reading is not plausible. It is. It's just not how I took it based on the way I was thinking about the case. And I think that possible reading was, was not uh, really covered by some of the commentators. All right. I have one <coughs> more question on King versus Burwell, and then we'll move from affordable care to clean air. Um, Justice Alito made a comment that I think is also getting a little bit of play. He suggested that perhaps Congress uh, that the court could issue its decision but stay the mandate for a couple of months to give Congress time to enact a fix. And I think he said the words Northern Pipeline and everyone's eyes sort of glazed over. Um, but so is there any there there to, to that suggestion? Your stay would have to last until we got a new Congress. I mean, you know, they, the, this Congress. Exactly. I mean, you know, I, I think there, you know, there, there, there's this idea that you want to you know, and there was objection I felt by some in the court when uh, Solicitor General really, you know, made the very uh, realistic point that you know you expect this Congress to you know fix a statute which I don't think needs fixing. But you know, look, it, it's just a reality that 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 this Congress, as Solicitor General really said, is not interested in fixing the statute. So the stay would have to be a very, very long stay. Do you think there might be some argument for a stay, though, to, to give the states some up, up time to exercise their option now that they know that it, they have this requirement in order to save their system? So. I mean, I think, you know, it's um, the question for the states is, is, is a difficult one because there is, 
even if you assume that the states would immediately want to set up exchanges, you're absolutely right that it would take a long time for them to do it. Well, maybe. Um, I mean, it seems to me if the state wanted to cooperatively, they could basically adopt the federal exchange and make it their own and brand it with the state's name. That's probably enough, right? right. I, mean, I don't but know. I, I haven't looked at this. But issue I think the, the secondary <laughs> problem is that there, in the same way we see with Congress, there is extreme recalcitrance in a lot of the states that yeah. are um, governed by Republican legislatures to set up an exchange. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think you have a very similar problem that you have with Congress in that case. Yeah, I, I think uh, it's, first of all, I think that the, the comment by the Solicitor General at argument that you know you can't really expect this Congress to do anything was not a, a, a prudent comment. I mean, it, it may have resonated with some people, but I don't think that's the type of comment that resonates with Justice Kennedy. Um, and he, in fact, made a comment pretty shortly thereafter at a, at, uh, a speech he was giving or, or some type of presentation where he said, uh, you know, some have suggested that the political gridlock should affect how we decide cases, and I think that's totally wrong. And a lot of people read into it that he was referring back to this comment. I don't think it was a smart thing to say. It's also not, I don't think it's necessarily true. There are a whole bunch of bills that are now pending. I think that uh, the Republicans certainly don't want to just uh, revise the law to, uh, so that it reads the way the defenders of the statute are, are claiming it reads. but. There certainly seem to be interested in passing something to, uh, if nothing else, to uh, uh, give the states some type of uh, cover so that they don't feel obligated to uh, jump into creating their own exchange immediately, which would really cement uh, in further the uh, implementation of, of the act. And to, to say, oh, no, we're going to have this transition plan until you know, 2016 when maybe we'll have a new president, so th don't take any action now. Uh, preserve the status quo, maybe make a few adjustments that the president might be able to swallow in order to avoid some of the consequences that uh, he's claimed would follow if, if we win the case. So I don't think it's at all clear that Congress won't act. And a stay of the mandate, uh, which I think might well appeal to some of the justices, I'm not sure it would appeal to five, but uh, to some of them, could really get through, could get you through the end of 2015. If it was if it was done properly, because there's also this three month grace period for not paying premiums. It's kind of complicated, but it could actually get you through the end of the year, so that 2016 would be sort of starting fresh with either something that Congress comes up with, or uh, the states, at least the ones who are willing to to uh, play ball with the administration, uh, creating an exchange. I think they would be able to do that in time if there was a, will, a political will and and federal cooperation. All right. Thank you. I, let's move on to Michigan versus EPA, and I'm going to ask Paul to talk a little bit about it. It's a case that has flown under the radar uh, some this term, in no small part, I imagine, because there were so many other big <laughs> cases. But Paul, you represented a group of energy companies and state and local governments supporting the EPA, and you had oral argument time. So can you talk a little bit about the, the background of the case and right. then sort of where your clients are coming from? So this is the, the EPA's regulation of hazardous chemicals coming out of smokestacks of power plants, which has been a political football now for 25 years since the 1990 amendments to the Clean Air Act, which uh, reacted to what was perceived as paralysis in the EPA's part of regulating these particular poisonous chemicals that are emitted by various sources. Uh, from, from the time of the original Clean Air Act up until 1990. And they, they set up, a, for most sources, a very rigid system that said, here's 189 chemicals which you are, you are required to, not, to deem as, as hazardous. And we want you to develop a list of every source in the country that emits these chemicals above a certain amount, which we're going to establish. And every such source, once you establish it, has to be regulated. Uh, and basically the minimum regulation is you have to make every every uh, example of that, that type of source, that category of sources, regulate as cleanly as the top 12 percent of that category. So they basically have, basically forcing regulation uh, and forcing um, all of these sources that are emitting these chemicals, mercury and other such chemicals, um, uh, uh, up to the top sort of state of the art, the top 12 percent of their category. And this was applied uh, after 1990 to all sorts of sources, uh, incinerators and dry cleaners and various things and produced a very substantial reduction in the emissions of these arsenic and all these cadmium and mercury and different things. But the, the act in 1990 had a special provision for electrical power plants that burn coal and oil. And uh, what they did there was they, say, they said to the uh, EPA, go do a three-year study of uh, 
the effects of uh, uh, the health effects of the emissions of these chemicals by electrical power plants, as well as the available technologies that exist. And once you do that three-year study, decide for yourselves, EPA, whether to regulate. And, um, and it, the standard that they set is regulate if it's necessary and appropriate to regulate. So the uh, Clinton administration uh, goes through that process, does the study, finds that these power plants are among the largest emitters of the most hazardous of these chemicals, including mercury that mercury is uh, being lodged in the, in the drinking water, in the waters of, of, of the country it comes down, it's then cons it then becomes in the bodies of fish, and when it's eaten, when those fish are eaten, it, they, uh, it lodges in um, the human body and causes tremendous damage primarily to fetuses and young children. Uh, so the Clinton, administ Clinton administration, on, on virtually the last day of the administration, said it's necessary and appropriate to regulate. They didn't go ahead and set all the limits that, that they, were, they were leaving office. The Bush administration five years later said it's not necessary and appropriate. Uh, we have various different ways to interpret the law. We don't we think that you can uh, look at the cumulative effects of the emissions of other, other sources. You have to look just at power plants, et cetera, et cetera. They, they decided not to regulate under this provision the emissions of mercury and other chemicals from power plants. They had some alternatives that they tried to put in place. Uh, that delisting of the source was held itself to be illegal by the D.C. Circuit. So we come along to the Obama administration. There's still no regulation of power plant emissions of hazardous chemicals. The Obama administration eventually decides to renew the finding that it's necessary and appropriate and to put in place a regulatory structure essentially identical to the one that was used for all the other sources. In other words, they're going to regulate all the hazardous pollutants and they're going to use the standard, minimum standard of floor of the, the, the cleanliness of the top 12% of power plants in, in a particular category. And they set up various categories, treating oil differently from coal and then subdividing those. But they basically had these minimum standards that all uh, coal and oil power plants had to get up to. These standards uh, take a, just took effect this month uh, after a period of implement, implementation time. The challenge was brought saying that um, they should have considered the cost of these regulations at, at, the, at the decision point when they decided to initiate regulation under that necessary and appropriate standard, uh, instead of only considering cost later on and deciding how strenuously to regulate. Uh, and that produced a, a split decision in the DC Circuit with the majority, Judge Garland, upholding the EPA's decision not to consider cost at that initial regulatory stage, only to consider health effects. Uh, and Judge Kavanaugh writing a, a, a dissent uh, that was then turned into a cert petition, which uh, was used to get cert granted, and um, so there we were in the Supreme Court, and uh, we, I, w I was on the side of the EPA defending it on behalf of utility companies who um, have, are already in compliance with these things and think, they're, think their fellow companies should be in compliance as well. And the argument we made was Chevron deference, you know, so there was a different interpretation of the Bush administration. Things shift back and forth between administrations, yeah. and so you say it's $9.6 billion a year, it's, Chevron deference applies to big things as well as little things, uh, and so uh, you have to defer. It could not be a, a broader standard necessary and appropriate uh, to give the EPA a choice of dis what considerations to consider at what stage of the process, and how could it possibly be beyond the pale for them to apply the basic same regulatory structure to power plants after they determined that there were health effects uh, of these chemicals, primarily mercury, as, the, as were applied to all the other sources back in the 1990s. The argument on the other side was that uh, massive costs uh, were imposed. This is going to put lots of the coal plants out of business. Uh, they should have decided whether to regulate based on, on re a recognition of how costly this would be. And it's really not really all that uh, uh, d dangerous anyway. And you're basically what they're doing is using this hazardous pollutant provision as a way to continue the war on coal. But basically, they're doing this to go after greenhouse gases and other particulates that they haven't been able to regulate under other provisions. And they don't really care about this mercury stuff anyway. That was kind of the, the gist of the argument on the other side. I'm not entirely sure I'm being fair to both sides, but you know how it is. Um, you don't have to be. Take it with a good, <laughs> take, take, take it with a bit of a grain of salt. But so we argued the case. It's still, it's still under submission. And um, I think it's a case where Justice Kennedy may have some influence you're, in deciding. You're kidding. <laughs> Either, yes. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to say that, and, and I'm not just saying this because he's sitting here, but um, Paul's role in this case was really important, and I think the argument um, was really important because it made clear to the court that this isn't a case of 
uh, you know, environmental advocates in the administration versus industry or environmental advocates in the administration versus the states. That, you know, Paul's clients in particular illustrated that there are industry voices that support this regulation. Um, and <coughs> when you have a court like the Roberts Court that, you know, generally is very pro-business, um, CAC has, you know, covered in, in, in the Roberts Court in particular the pro-corporate bent of um, the majority. And so that's really important to have been presented to the court in addition to the great argument that the Solicitor General made. And I think also, you know, we, this is a court that cares about the states and federalism. And so to also uh, put out there that there are states that support this regulation is very important. Right. And there are states that even, you know, go further than this regulation with even more stringent emissions. So I think that was a really important presentation to the court in this case. The point we made was that the, that the market for delivering power to the power grid is hyper-competitive. It's, it's like a constant auction orchestrated by computers. So small differences in marginal cost make a huge difference of how much power you get to sell. Mm -hmm. And so the companies that have put the scrubbers on or, or otherwise found a way to comply with this are at, at, at constant disadvantage in that sort of constant computerized auction because they don't, they don't have they the same cost advantages as, as the, some of these older plants that are not, not really cleaned up. Well, unlike in, in the uh, Obamacare case, I don't think there's any doubt that when Congress said necessary and appropriate, they well, were delegate. certainly delegating <laughs> to the EPA to do something. Uh, you know, do the science, figure it out, do the analysis, weigh them. Uh, I think the question, as the, uh, some of the challengers would put it, is, okay, but when you're figuring out if it's appropriate, uh, do you at least have to look at both sides of the ledger? Um, there can be deference in how you calculate, what you count, how you, how you balance them against each other, but uh, the argument would be, well, how can you figure out if something is appropriate if you're only looking at the benefits and not the costs? I mean, well, the, the, the thing that's interesting about the case is that the EPA did do a cost-benefit analysis. They, they said, we're not considering it at the decision point of deciding whether to regulate, but because of various regulations from OMB, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis whenever you regulate. And they did this cost-benefit analysis. They didn't quantify all the benefits of, of eliminating mercury and a lot of these other chemicals, but they, they, they quantified some of them. And then they had, it was very easy for them to quantify one of the things that would happen as a result of these, these regulations which is a substantial reduction in particulate matter going out into the air. Some of it, these hazardous chemicals, some of it just uh, other chemicals or, or substances, and they, 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 they came to the conclusion that the benefits of all of that, including these benefits that are sort of collateral because they involve uh, pollution other than the hazardous pollutants themselves, massively were outweighed any of the costs. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the, one of the things that was sort of going on there was what what benefits count? Does it have to just be benefits related to these particular chemicals? Or the fact that you're going after those chemicals produces all these other benefits, can you weigh that in the balance too? All right, I'm gonna let you have the last word on that. And we're gonna move on uh, to civil rights. Uh, the Roberts Court, some people with decisions like Parents Involved and Shelby County more recently, view it as chipping away at some of the traditional civil rights protections. But this term is going to be one of the bigger civil rights terms in recent memory with uh, the Fair Housing Act case and same-sex marriage, among others. So where do you see this term fitting in, or is it really too soon to tell? Because we don't have decisions in some of the major cases yet. Maybe too too broad of a category <laughs> to be to be very meaningful. I mean, civil rights, uh, you know, I think that the Roberts Court has been uh, has been very uh, aggressive in, in expanding certain civil rights, uh, First Amendment rights in particular. Uh, you know, I think everyone would agree a campaign finance uh, and campaign finance law. The court has been quite uh, aggressive in in opening that that up. Um, certainly, on ra in race matters, I think the court has uh, more recently uh, been um, moving in, in a different direction in terms of uh, being more skeptical towards some of the uh, racial preferences and uh, uh, consideration of race in, in certain matters. But uh, it sort of depends what civil rights you're talking about, I think. The, 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 the case that had the civil rights community worried was the, the housing case, that mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they were going to say that there is no disparate impact test applies under the Fair Housing Act. As there has been a disparate impact test applied uh, for many, many years by the, under various lower court decisions. 
and that means you don't have to prove that the, dis the activity was done with, for the purpose of, of hurting people based on their race, but, but just with a disparate impact and without a sufficient justification that there were other ways you could have done something with lesser impact that would have been equally effective. Uh, and you know, the court's taken this issue multiple times. The last two were settled out from under them. Uh, and I think everybody sort of assumed that the, there was a majority. It may not be, though, it turns out, because Justice Scalia was... Yeah, for once, we're not talking about Justice Kennedy. Justice Scalia was very <laughs> skeptical, at least at times during the argument, that there was, that you could interpret this statute uh, as not having a disparate impact test, because it was amended in 1988, and there were the provisions that, that were passed in 1988 said, this will not count as a disparate impact. I mean, it didn't quite say it, but that, effectively that's what it says. These things that, which are disparate impacts should, not, should no longer be illegal. So he said, you know, how can you read the statute as not having a disparate impact requirement if they're creating exceptions to that requirement? Uh, you know, whether or not he'll end up doing that, I don't know. It's also interesting because he's already written an opinion back in the Ritchie case which he says the disparate impact test is probably unconstitutional. So maybe what he's going to do is go ahead and say it's unconstitutional. That basically it's a racial preference. It requires people to think about the racial consequences of actions when they don't, when they didn't want to talk, think about race at all. They simply wanted to build a housing development someplace, and that that's, that by itself is a problem. Yeah, that was you know a, we're talking about things that were surprising. You know, I certainly went into the oral argument that day, um, you know, very pessimistic because as Paul pointed out. You know, the court has sort of gone out of its way to try to get this issue before there's it. There's no circuit split. Even though there's yet, no circuit split, taking you know, it. 11 circuits that have considered this have found the disparate impact test to be um, one that's in the statute. And so, you know, I certainly went in with very low expectations, and then Scalia starts asking these questions about how, well, don't these amendments make clear that there's a disparate impact uh, test in the statute? And then, of course, there are some you know, sort of, uh, I think partly because we're prone to worrying, um, you know, uh, supporters of the law who, who think that, you know, Scalia has this sort of, you know, master plan of saying, yes, the statute makes clear that there's a disparate impact um, claim available under the Fair Housing Act, but we, I believe that that test is unconstitutional, and so we're going to uh, strike it down altogether. You know, I would say that with respect to the Fair Housing Act case, I think, you know, in another term, um, it would be getting a lot more attention than it is, um, and it should get a lot of attention because, you know, it is, you know, one of the most important pieces of civil rights legislation that our country has, and these disparate impact claims are incredibly important to realizing the promise of fair housing. And so I think that, you know, particularly after the court, um, particularly after the court, <coughs> two years ago gutted the Voting Rights Act to then take away this very important part of the Fair Housing Act and civil rights legislation would be very troubling. And I think it would you know, sort of add to the um, Roberts Court legacy of being very bad on, um, in my opinion, supporting um, efforts to that Congress has done pursuant to its constitutional enforcement powers to promote equality um, and uh, root out racial discrimination in this country. All right, Yakov, take us into the mind of Justice Scalia. I can do that, but just uh, at first. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, first, I would say, <laughs> as to why they're so interested in hearing this case, I don't know why they took it the first time, but I can bet that the reason they keep <laughs> taking it is precisely because the case settled, and it wasn't didn't just a random settlement. It was this very controversial decision by D a DOJ official to uh, trade uh, the settlement of, of that case uh, by City of St. Paul for dropping certain charges that, that the DOJ was pursuing against St. Paul precisely to keep the case from reaching the court. And I think, I think some people might quibble with that description. Well, that's, that, at least, that's at least out there as, a, as, as a one narrative of what happened. So, and I think when that is out there, uh, that only redoubles the court's uh, interest in uh, saying, no, I'm not, we are not going to let uh, the government manipulate our docket in that way. We're going to hear the case. I don't think it, it necessarily foretells how they're going to come out on the case. And um, Justice Scalia had written this opinion in, in the age discrimination context where he joined the courts for more liberal justices in saying that you can have a disparate impact claim uh, under that statute. And so many people thought, well, maybe he'll do the same thing here. And certainly some of his questions seem to suggest that. Uh, I don't, I would not bet on that happening. Um, and I think it, it does have something to do with Justice Scalia's views about disparate impact in the race context in particular. Sure. 
uh, raising constitutional issues. I do not think he's going to say in this case that it's unconstitutional. It hasn't, I don't think, been briefed or really presented. But to say that it, 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 would, be a, it would raise some serious constitutional issues if the government were uh, forcing uh, the people who are bound by the Fair Housing Act, to include public entities, to uh, consider race when they otherwise would not have been considering race in making their uh, decisions about zoning and so forth, uh, is a you know raises some serious equal protection issues as he as he dis described in his Ricci concurrence a few years back, uh, and so I'm not you know there are some conflicting signals in the statute, but I'm not going to read the statute that way. So I, if I had to bet, I think I would bet on this one coming out against the uh, the disparate impact theory. All right, let's talk about the main event this week at the court: same-sex marriage. Um, you know, two years ago, Justice Kennedy during the Proposition 8 case, you know, on both sides of the argument, what about the children? Um, this year, the what about the children seemed mostly to be on, on one side, you know, he pushing back against the state's argument uh, about marriage and, and procreation, but he still, you know, really gave the lawyer, gave Mary Bonato a, a fairly hard time, you know, talking about this idea, echoing the Chief Justice's idea that marriage has been defined as a union between a man and a woman for millennia. Um, we, we heard that word a lot on Tuesday, and, and you know, it's, it's too soon for the courts to step in. So you know, where do we think he's going in the end? My view is that, that he will vote with the plaintiffs, that he asked that question at the beginning about the millennia because it is the issue that he worries about, but he very quickly moved towards saying, of course, it's the same number of years since Lawrence as we had between Brown mm -hmm. and Loving, uh, and he is, a, he is clearly very acutely aware that um, unlike in, in, during the previous 2,000 years, we now have hundreds of thousands of families in which same-sex couples are in fact raising children, and those, those people have a claim to invoke the 14th Amendment. So it seems to me, and certainly the, he didn't seem to be very persuaded by anything the lawyer from Michigan said, Mr. Birch, uh, about the state's interest in avoiding helping those people out, mm -hmm. that ultimately he will uh, come around. That, that, but certainly, I think he succeeded in making everybody feel less than certain about that by the right. end, <laughs> end of the argument, if that's he what he's trying to guessing. do. He's exactly. part of his job. Exactly. Yes. But, but I, just, you know, I, I think far from being persuaded from what the Michigan lawyer was saying, I think you know, he was actually quite put off you know, because one of the things that, you know, you, you don't want to say bad things about dignity to Justice Kennedy. And, you know, when, I, when the Michigan lawyer got up there and was starting to say about how marriage has nothing to do with love and commitment and is not dignity conferring, you know, you could, you know, Justice Kennedy practically leapt out of his seat and said, you know, are you kidding me? Um, and, you know, said, and I, I think that, you know, when it was very telling to hear the difference in how he talked about the concerns at the beginning of the argument about, well, this has been the definition uh, for millennia, you know, which he said, but he seemed to be more of like the sort of Kennedy hand wringing, you know, as opposed to his comments about how, you know, marriage is, you know, is dignity conferring and these couples and their families simply want the same ennoblement. That was the word he used. Right. And he was much more eloquent and I thought um, passionate about those comments. And that, you know, gave me encouragement that he was going to um, recognize that the Constitution guarantees the equality of gay and lesbian couples and their family and their rights to um, enter into the dignity conferring institution of marriage. And you know, one thing that I thought was really striking, um, just sort of both personally and as a lawyer, is you know to come from sort of the real world, um, the outside world, where you know you have many, so many gay and lesbian couples who are married, have been married forever, have beautiful families, are, you know, in public life, in pop culture, and, you know, think about the generational differences where it simply just isn't a big deal to a lot of young people. And then to sort of immediately start out with the, you know, hand wringing about, you know, oh my gosh, what is going to happen if we change marriage um, was just kind of jarring to me um, and sort of a reminder of, um, uh, how how you know sort of small C conservative the court might be on this, but I think when they really get down to it, the idea that the states should be left to on their own um, decide fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Constitution, I don't think that Justice Kennedy and a majority of justices will go that way. Well, this is 
one where I, I'm going to have to agree with, uh, with both I of you. I know it hurts you. Not on the merits, not on the merits, but on, on the prediction, uh, just to be clear. Uh, for, okay. for three, re I mean, three reasons. One is the stays. You, you, don't, you don't deny stays and let all these marriages happen if you think there's a, a realistic possibility that you're going to say that they're... Uh, that you know they have to be rescinded or anything like that. So that was a really strong signal that I think uh, you know was, showed where the court thought it was going. Um, number two, you know, y you don't write Windsor the way you did if you're Justice Kennedy and then come out the other way in this case. I think Justice Scalia was right in his dissent in the sense that this you know that case did foretell how the court was viewing the issue and how it was likely to come out. That's certainly how all the lower, most of the lower courts read it. Um, and third, I think Justice Kennedy does fundamentally see marriage as the state's conferral of dignity or ennoblement, if, mm -hmm. if that's the word he used, on people. Uh, and if you view it that way, then it becomes a lot easier to say, well, you shouldn't discriminate, you know, in this, between this type of relationship and that type of relationship. You know, I didn't really, I don't really think of the government being in the business of ennobling people. Uh, so I sort of take a different view of, of what the purpose of the institution is, and that would lead you to a different result. But that's certainly not how he sees it, and I think he's gonna, that's going to carry the day here. Uh, one of my colleagues on the blog observed you know, the, the recognition question, the second question of the day, whether states have to recognize same-sex marriages from other states, you know, only comes into play if the states win on the first question. Um, and he observed that Justice Kennedy was pretty much silent during that part of the oral argument, suggesting that perhaps he knew how the case might come out and whether that <laughs> would be relevant. Um, but So if, as all of you seem to think, perhaps Justice Kennedy joins the court's four more liberal justices, um, does the Chief Justice go along with him? I, mean, I think that's the interesting question. You know, um, I, going into argument, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have counted him out. You know, I think he was careful in Windsor to uh, make his dissent about federalism and not sort of join some of the um, other dissenting justices' statements, you know, that would seem to have indicated their views on this question. Um, and so I wouldn't have counted out his, his uh, vote in this case. And then also, you know, there was that question that a lot of um, folks have been focusing on about, you know, it, even if, um, you know, do we not even have to get to whether this is an uh, instance of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation? Can we not just do it on, you know, the basis of sort of um, uh, sex discrimination? And he used the, um, you know, example of, uh, you know, if Sue and Joe both love Tom, only Sue can marry Tom. And so why isn't, you know, and the difference is based on their sex. And so why can't we just do this under our, you know, sex discrimination canon? Um, you know, I think Mary Bonato had an excellent um, answer for that on behalf of the plaintiffs challenging these laws, which is, you know, if that's how you want to go, you know, Chief Justice Roberts, okay, um, absolutely, be my guest. Um, um, but, you know, also pointing out that, you know, part of the reason you take the sexual orientation discrimination into account is because it gets at, um, you know, the, 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 the deep harm when you affix second class citizenship on these couples and their families. But, you know, I thought that was really interesting and it was something that Justice Kennedy brought up in the Perry argument as something that he found interesting, you know, going on this um, uh, sex discrimination angle instead of sexual orientation. So, you know, I, I could see Chief Justice Roberts writing a concurrence um, on that ground. I, I don't think it's impossible. It seems so odd though. <laughs> <laughs> to say that the, the Defense of Marriage Act it does not violate anything, and the, but the states, when they decide not to marry people, do violate. I mean, I, it, you'd have to basically eat his, his dissent, I think, in the Doma case. And so it, it, I'm, I'm all for that, but you know, <laughs> I, I, it seems to me, my, my sense is justices really worry about their personal consistency from case to case a lot more than almost anything else. And that, that, that was a hard one for him to, do, to write. I'm sure he believed what he wrote in his Windsor dissent. Um, and so I think he probably still does believe it. I agree with you. I, I would not expect him to, to, to join the, the other five on this one. Uh, it's just, I, I think he'll write his dissent, if he writes a dissent in a, in a perhaps a different tone than some of the other justices might write a dissent, uh, much like the way Judge Sutton wrote his opinion going, the, you know, uh, upholding the, the ban uh, for the Sixth Circuit, which was a very sort of, respe I thought, respectful thoughtful sort of uh, analysis of, look, there are arguments here, uh, but this is really a policy question, 
not a constitutional question. I, I, I suspect that the chief will write something similar to that. All right, so shifting gears slightly, not completely, um, talking a little bit about the First Amendment. And as we saw with the williams Yuley case yesterday, th this is a court that likes an awful lot of speech, although not necessarily all speech. Um, but the First Amendment and religion, um, where does the sort of this term fit in with the Roberts Court and religion more generally? There's not a lot of religion this term, uh, as far as I can tell, in, on the docket. I mean, we had Hobby Lobby last year, obviously, or, um, and we may have uh, a sequel to Hobby Lobby uh, next year, but uh, I think we have a bit of a break. Uh, yeah, there was the beard case. There's a beard case. The not, not a very difficult case. We Everybody loved the beard. <laughs> and that, it was perfectly obvious that the, the security concerns were fairly minimal because right. you know most of the prisons in the United States allow them to have beards and kept to a certain length. Right. I mean, at the and point that you've got Justice Alito making fun of you and you're the you know representing the state in that case, you're probably in some trouble. Yeah. Probably the easiest in, in, know, in many, case of the term. In many ways, the most striking reference to religion, I think, was Justice Scalia's questions the other day about why wouldn't it, it, same sex marriage require. Uh, uh, all ministers and priests in the country to marry same-sex couples, which was, I thought, just really bizarre. <laughs> I mean, it seemed to be such an obviously wrong point. Uh, yes. but, well, but, 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 and Justice Alito asked a question about whether uh, schools that don't recognize uh, same-sex marriage would have to lose their charitable status, <coughs> sort of touching on the Bob, you know, the Bob Jones decision, which uh, was similar, but as to, as to race matters a little, uh, number of decades ago. And I think the Solicitor General's response was, well, there will be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> there will be an issue there. And so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, I think a signal of perhaps some difficult religion questions to come. Uh, I think in, that's fair to say. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so, where, like, so talk that out a little bit. I mean, where else, I think that's a, a good point. What else might we see? I mean, are we going to see another sort of repeat of the Elaine photography case in which the court relisted a cert petition? Uh, three times this was a photographer who didn't want to photograph a same-sex marriage commitment ceremony. Was it actually even a marriage ceremony? I mean, I think certainly, um, you know, we might see some of those issues, I think, particularly um, if we um, get a ruling from the court endorsing marriage equality and recognizing um, that constitutional right, then, you know, you could see some, some, but I... I, I hope and I don't think you know there'll be a ton of, of backlash, but I think you could see that in the states with some of these um, uh, uh, state RIFRA laws. But I think another area of law that definitely is going to be bubbling up to the court um, maybe next term or the term after that is you know sort of the aftermath of Hobby Lobby. You know the court has sent back to the lower courts cases, you know pushing um, exploring the boundaries of that case sending them back to reevaluate in light of the Hobby Lobby ruling. So they haven't wanted to take that issue now before the lower courts have had more time to work it out. So I think that's the signal they're sending, but I'm sure it's going to come back. And what, one of the big issues is, is to the extent that there are re regulations prohibiting employment discrimination based on sexual orientation, is that going to be something that an employer can say has a, for religious reasons, I have a right to uh, not, not honor? Uh, and the, the Hobby Lobby opinion, while it said racial discrimination prescriptions are, are based on a compelling interest and would be enforceable, notably didn't refer to anything else. You know, and there, while there is no federal employment discrimination ban on uh, protecting uh, gay people now, the president did issue an executive order saying that all uh, federal contractors have to stop discriminating if they've been discriminating. And, uh, and so there could be such a case under federal law. It could also come up, I suppose, under a state law. Uh, State refer. Yeah, more likely to come up under under state law at least at this point because, from federal perspective, there isn't really a, a free exercise a viable free exercise challenge in that context. I don't think as a result of Smith, uh, there, you know, if you have a generally applicable law, you don't get a religious <laughs> exemption for it. We, generally, that was going to happen. That, that was the answer to Hobby Lobby, but uh, well, but Hobby <laughs> Lobby, was, but Hobby Lobby, you have you have RIFRA, which is a, right. a st statutory overlay that provides greater protection. So that's that is applicable to federal statutes and federal regulatory actions, but it wouldn't be applicable. Uh, uh, you know, to any state discrimination right, would, would law. Apply to the president's executive order. That's right, and that's where that's where it could come up. But outside of that context, yeah. more likely to come up in the state context, where states, some states, have these additional RIFRA-like protections. Um, not Indiana, I guess, but some mm -hmm. other ones. And uh, and so certainly, yeah, if, if we if we have 
same-sex marriage that is uh, across the board, across the country, uh, I would think we would see at least some additional cases uh, along those lines. All right. Well, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, but uh, sort of take us another step back. This is about to be the end of the 10th term for the Roberts Court, and the court has before it two of the biggest cases, I think, during the, the Roberts Court era. It's got same-sex marriage and ACA subsidies. And so my question for you all to, to sort of finish up before we take questions is, you know, will his votes in these cases shape his legacy, recognizing that he's still quite young and could have another 20 or 30 years on the bench, and how so? I mean, I think absolutely this term is arguably um, you know, going to be the defining term for the Roberts Court. And, you know, if you all are right and that he's not going to vote with the majority on the marriage equality cases, you know, we could see the defining case of the Roberts Court go ahead without Chief Justice Roberts. Um, and, you know, it, he could just be a footnote to history on, on this case um, instead of uh, in the majority. And, you know, I, um, I think that would be rather remarkable. You know, you also have Again, the idea that Chief Justice Roberts has put out there very strongly is I think what he wants to be part of his legacy is that, you know, trying to keep the court as above the partisan fray. And so again, with the Affordable Care Act case, you know, if he um, votes against the administration in King, then that sort of, uh, you know, undermines his previous vote in the constitutional challenge as being something that was, um, you know, focused on the law and not politics. and voting based on the Constitution and not on what may be his personal policy preferences. And, you know, I think we see across the board, um, you know, the way that Chief Justice Roberts has affected the uh, general movement of the law. And I would just recommend to everyone to check out an amazing series that um, my colleagues at the Constitutional Accountability Center have been putting together, um, led by Brianne Garrod. Um, uh, the Roberts at 10 series that goes through various areas of law and Chief Justice Roberts's <laughs> role um, in moving those areas in one direction or another. Um, and you know, you see, I think particularly on race discrimination. You know, he started out early in his in uh, his career as Chief Justice with the Seattle Schools decision, saying the way to stop. Uh, racial discrimination is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. And the way that that has played out through his opinions, um, you know, I think is very remarkable and I think um, not consistent with the Constitution, but it certainly is a mark that he has made on the court. And so I think this term, in addition to the big blockbuster ACA cases, marriage cases, um, also how he votes in the Fair Housing Act will continue that important part and trend in his legacy. And, and you know, I, I, um, I from a personal standpoint, totally agree with him that the court should be ruling based on the Constitution and the law and precedent and not be above politics. And so I would like for him to be correct and to be an agent of that vision. Um, I'm not so sure um, he always lives up to it, but it's definitely going to be part of his legacy. Paul, we'll give Yakov the it last does, word. It does seem to me that the vote in the ACA case, if, uh, what, if it turns out that five justices interpret the ACA in a way that I think is uh, not not really plausible as a as a final matter of statutory construction in a way that destroys the act or much of the act will change how he's perceived for for quite a while and maybe forever and because a lot of the other things that the court has done will be perceived in a very different way if the court has gone after Obamacare in that very aggressive way and then things like the campaign finance cases and the race cases uh, begin to look much more political I think than than uh, they will look if the chief justice or Kennedy or both end up uh, basically saying, well, we, I guess we're just going to go along and apply and read the statute the way we think it was int fully intended to be read. And uh, so th I think that's the huge linchpin. And the last word. I'm not sure either of the, the two cases that we've been talking about the most are likely to have much of an impact on the Chief Justice's legacy. I think of the marriage cases as Justice Kennedy's legacy, you know, continuing from Lawrence and, and Windsor, and, and this will be sort of the capstone on, on that for him. I think if, you know, I, I don't know how King is going to come out, but if it comes out in, in uh, favor of the plaintiffs, our side, uh, I think it's more likely to be seen as really a, a victory for Justice Scalia's legacy. It's, it would be a, a real, you know, uh, fidelity to, te to text in a sense that he's really been the champion of, not so much the Chief Justice. I, I don't expect the Chief Justice to write the opinion if it comes out that way. I also think that, uh, that depending on the political fallout, it, it could turn out to uh, not 
be that consequential. Um, whether that's because states decide to opt in, whether it's because Congress passes some type of transition. Uh, I don't think that the, that the massive consequences that people have been predicting are going to uh, materialize. And so I don't think it's going to, in the long term, uh, be seen as uh, particularly important the way his campaign finance cases have really reshaped elections uh, and the way his race cases have reshaped you know, affirmative action and a lot of other areas. Uh, I don't think this case is likely to have that type of long-term uh, significance. Excellent. Well, I, we have left about 15 minutes for questions. There's a microphone. If you could just wait until you get the microphone so that the camera can pick up your comments as well. The consensus uh, both here and outside of this room seems to be that the, the smart money, as it were, is, is going that the court, the majority, is going to find uh, um, for the plaintiffs in the in the same-sex marriage case, um, or for the couples, for the same-sex couples. So I guess the question is, um, how doctrinally broadly do you believe that the decision will be written, and um, and do you think that the presumably the four more liberal justices and Justice Kennedy, which everybody seems to think is the five person, five justice majority, would they moderate doctrinally in order to get the chief on there? I, I guess I don't really see a spectrum of moderate to um, more extreme that's available to them. Either they're, they're, It's kind of a binary question. Either the, the 14th Amendment does or doesn't require states to marry these people. So I'm not really sure. Um, how, how they could moderate in a way that would make things more palatable to the chief than, than otherwise. I mean, maybe he'll come along, but I don't, I don't really see it breaking down that way. Um, there, there are different options they have, due process, equal protection. Do they finally address the question of heightened scrutiny into the four factors and say it's going to have intermediate scrutiny from now on, or, or do they continue, as they have done, to sort of just apply intermediate scrutiny without saying so, uh, which yeah, is... Don't, uh, don't bet on, um, on any I mean, I think if... If we're right that it's a five-justice majority, Kennedy will write it, and he'll probably write it a lot like Windsor and Lawrence, which didn't really answer that question and for, for whatever reason. But it's, you know, I think the, the, we've effectively gotten there, so it may not ma matter that much. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, think, I think Justice Kennedy's very likely to write it, and he, he writes broadly uh, philosophically, uh, but not necessarily broadly when it comes to doctrine, and, and really parsing out exactly what he's doing doctrinally is not always the easiest task. So. Uh, I think well, it'll be a, a very grand opinion, but I don't know that it will uh, have a lot of uh, significant doctrinal significance outside of this question. I mean, the, the broadest decision would be a sex discrimination decision because that could then be applied to other forms of uh, statutory pre protection against gender discrimination that, that are not currently interpreted necessarily to apply to sexual orientation discrimination. So. Yeah, I, I think you know the way that the court gets to the <coughs> ruling will be you know, in history, sort of the secondary point, but a very interesting point, and whether the court, you know, engages with both um, the due process doctrine and the liberty interest there, or goes with the Equal Protection Clause. There was um, discussion and oral argument um, about both, and, um, you know, I think that will be very interesting, but I, I, I don't think that if Justice Kennedy is writing, which I think we all think he will, um, if, uh, which I think probably either way, um, but, you know, I, I think that um, if he writes, I couldn't see him moderating, you know, what he wants to write for the chief. If he does come along, you know, I would see more of like, you know, the chief joining in a separate um, concurrence if he wanted to go with, you know, um, a, a slightly different ground. Anyone else? Ariane? Right. Hey. <laughs> strict orders. Um, so I have two questions, I think, for Yaakov. Uh, I don't think I got where you think it'll, Scalia will finally be on the uh, housing discrimination. And then could you flesh out a little bit more? You talked about the chief's legacy in health care. But if he were to vote to uphold the bans in um, the gay marriage cases, what, do, what does that do with his legacy? All right, well, on the, on the Fair Housing Act, uh, my prediction was that Justice Scalia would, uh, would rule against the existence of a, of a disparate impact theory under the statute. So that would be in favor of, I guess, Texas is the, 
is the party nominally. But he gave um, a very good recitation of how the did. statute has been amended to make clear he that. He did. So it's that's I mean, why he it's, made the great argument. And that's why that's why it's being discussed. Otherwise, I don't think anyone would even be <laughs> considering this <laughs> vote as, put on the list. You know, as up for grabs. <laughs> but uh, my guess is that ultimately he'll say the statute is different from the age discrimination statute, where he, which he said does recognize a, a disparate impact cause of action. Look, the fact that there was a subsequent amendment that seemed to recognize disparate impact and then limit it uh, shows that the subsequent Congress wanted to limit it. It doesn't show that they believe that it should exist. It did because there were uh, circuit court decisions that said it existed. So Congress said, well, we don't want that to apply to this and that. That doesn't mean they were necessarily endorsing everything that the circuit courts had done to date uh, in terms of recognizing disparate impact under that statute. So I don't expect that he'll uh, ultimately uh, support the disparate impact in that context. I think the constitutional concerns he has about race play into that as well. Um, in terms of the Chief Justice's legacy, you know, I, I don't know how this case is going to be, the marriage cases will be seen in 30 years or 50 years, uh, but he's certainly not the only person on the court who is skeptical of this claim. Uh, I think 10 years ago, everyone on the court might have been skeptical of the claim. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I can't predict. I can't predict how future generations will see it, but I don't think anyone is going to be terribly surprised that he that he's in dissent on this one. Here comes the mic. Thank you. I was wondering, for all of you, is affirmative action coming back because you've had some more um, uh, activity around the Fisher case, and to me, in any way, it looked as if this might be a repeat of what happened with the voting rights, where you had everybody got together in one decision and sort of said, we're getting impatient, fix this. And then in the Fisher case, there seemed to be a sort of similar thing, only directed to lower courts instead of to Congress, to saying, fix this. And I was wondering, do you think there's an appetite on the part of the Chief Justice and some of the other conservatives that, you know, you know, we, we, gave, we gave the courts a chance to, to really be rigorous by our standards and they didn't, and now we're going to finally, you know, have the showdown. I think it's uh, quite likely, and I, I think the interesting thing about that case is they don't really need the Chief Justice's vote to grant cert um, to take the case back, because Justice Kennedy is very strong on on that issue and uh, in his opposition <laughs> to to affirmative action. Uh, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito are all pretty clearly staked out ground on that, and. Uh, you know, it may be that the Chief Justice doesn't want to wade into it, but he may not have a choice. And when it comes down to it, I think his views on that are pretty clear as well. So I, I, would, I would definitely uh, say there's a, there's a really good likelihood of that case coming back. I'm not sure, because it seems to me the Fisher case was their opportunity to do that. They had an open field. If they had five votes to actually do something different from what Grutter and Gratz did, and they, they could have done it then. They couldn't get five votes together. And they tried and tried and tried. They ended up writing this anodyne thing that doesn't, tell, doesn't basically do anything. Um, so uh, it seems to me that they must have a vote problem there to get five votes to actually push the, the limits of affirmative action more aggressively than they already have been. I think, I think that's right. I mean, I, you know, um, I, I think that, um, you know, particularly when you read Justice Sotomayor's, you know, vigorous um, and very uh, powerful dissent in that case, you know, which, um, according to Joan Biskupic's great book, you know, uh, apparently, um, you know, caused some second thoughts amongst the justices um, in their votes. And so, you know, as opposed to the voting rights context where, you know, you had, you know, Chief Justice Roberts laying the groundwork um, uh, and then, you know, giving the death blow um, to a critical part of the Voting Rights Act, you know, the willingness to give that death blow in um, the affirmative action context, I don't know, is there in the same way. There's, there's always an interest in getting a broad opinion if you can, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard, just hard for me to see what the vote problem would have been. Uh, maybe, they did, maybe they did want more analysis of the facts or more record development or something like that from the Fifth Circuit, but, uh, it, you know, the, the, it's true that they, they wouldn't really have been relying on or hoping that Congress would fix the problem the way they arguably were hoping Congress would fix the Voting Rights Act in that uh, sequence of cases. But, you know, give some guidance, hope it goes away, 
if the Fifth Circuit really sticks to its guns and actually, you know, sort of doubles down, I don't know. I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see it back. Thanks. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our terrific panelists.